Happy Friday. Welcome to ACR's webinar on the 2018 Digital Mammography Quality Control Manual for Medical Physicists. My name is Dustin Gress. I'm Senior Advisor for Medical Physics at the ACR. I'm joined in the room with Pamela Platt, ACR's Mammography Accreditation Program Manager and FDA Liaison. Last week, we had a uh, webinar for technologists. That webinar and its slides have been posted on ACR's Digital Mammography QC Resources QC Manual Resources webpage. You can Google that and find our FAQs and the webinar and other information. Similarly, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted along with its slides, hopefully next week. You may enter questions in the GoToWebinar box for questions. Uh, staff will see them as they come in. We'll do our best to answer the questions if time permits. Uh, some questions we may discuss internally and answer in a future update to our QC Manual FAQs or perhaps by email. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Eric Burns. He's chair of ACR's subcommittee on quality assurance in mammography. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Thank you, Dustin. And welcome, everybody. And thank you for um, giving us a little bit of your time today to present in probably a little bit different format um, than in past presentations, um, some of the important features on the um, 2018 Digital Mammography QC Manual, um, and also some tips on, some recommendations on how to consider transitioning and adopting the new program. So as Dustin was saying, on the right, there's a control panel that everybody um, most likely sees, and that little yellow arrow box in the top left will uh, minimize or open it up, and then in the bottom, there's a place to put questions. And so this is where we're hoping people will write out the questions as we go along. The ACR staff will be reading those as we go um, through. And then at the end, if there are some things um, that are easily addressed, um, the staff and or myself will try and address the simple questions. And if there's things that need to be um, reviewed more thoroughly, we will um, take a look at those next week and get those addressed either in an FAQ or in a direct email or something. So please don't hesitate to put in the comments because we this is one of the primary ways we or the ACR has um, um, gets the pulse of what's going on out there and what the questions are. So it's really important you send in questions and um, try and be helpful with um, to the staff. So with that, the overview of today, we're going to try and address a couple of things. First is the why. So we want to review and introduce some of the benefits of the ACR digital mammography program. We want to review the resources of where to go to help because this is often um, when the questions come up, where do you go? Um, we, I want to present an overview of the tests in the phantom, um, both um, the physics tests that are mostly um, revised that include TOMO, and then some of the technologist tests that they are going to have to face and will rely on the physicist to help them with that. We want to talk about when and how to transition to the new QC manual and talk about strategy and steps um, that will help facilities um, accomplish this. Um, we all know that times have changed um, from even the beginning of the digital era where there was a single unit and a single workstation and a single facility, but that is um, not the case anymore. Um, and then how to perform the QC test last. So um, we used to kind of do the how much higher in this list, but we're gonna put those at the end um, and try and just point out some of the important new things that could um, also contribute to the why and the when on this um, this list. So to start, um, it's, it's important to understand what this manual is, and it is a an alternative standard to other QC manuals. So the FDA issued an alternative standard, standard document that says that the ACR digital mammography program can replace a manufacturer system. So this is um, seems to be an ongoing challenge for um, people to either understand or accept. Um, but if the 
the ACR program is implemented and adopted completely, then you can stop manufacturer QC manual. So it does replace those programs. This is an option. This is not required. Um, that's another misconception or a question that always comes up is, do we have to switch? And the answer is no, you don't. This is an option um, to the current manufacturer's manual. Now, the, one of the purposes of this presentation is to present reasons why you may want to switch and some of the advantages, because we feel there's a lot of advantages. And in the long run, um, everybody will benefit from those advantages. So we're going to try and highlight those today. So again, facilities are not required to switch. This is um, an important note. Um, facilities and technologists always have this question, so we try and highlight this. Um, this is an option and a choice to switch to the program, so this is not required. Um, and if we were having SAM uh, questions at the end, that would be one of the questions, of course, is, is it required, yes or no? Um, so one of the things that is important also to um, highlight is the difference between calibrations and QC tests. So as an asterisk to the um, alternative standard that the FDA issued for the QC manual and the QC program, we um, the, the manual contains QC tests. If there are calibrations that are required by the manufacturer for those specific um, maker models, those still need to continue to occur. So we, the ACR did not define or describe calibrations in, their QC, in the QC program. We put a place for them to be able to be documented that they were performed um, for purposes of just record keeping and purposes of um, reminders for mostly the technologists to include those calibrations in their QC program. So it's just important and it's probably more important for when you start working with, with facilities and techs to continue to highlight the differences between calibration and a test. Because sometimes at the end of a calibration, as you know, it may say pass. So that can be misconstrued as a QC test. So anyway, I'd just like to highlight that here. Um, and then remind you that this also information needs to get to the text because they have even less familiarity with these um, terms. So I wanted to bring up a few non-obvious reasons and benefits to switching to the ACR QC manual. Um, and this is a sort of a new line of thinking um, about how what, what would be an advantage to the physicist, which is what the objective of this uh, session is. Switching to the manual and the QC program provides the opportunity to reset and reestablish the relationship of the physicist with the tech, the RAD, and the facility. And this will highlight and demonstrate the value of the medical physicist. So I have a few points here on demonstrating value, which I think are important and things we overlook, but I think as a profession and as a component of the quality control program, it's important to remember these things because they get lost in the day-to-day -day, um, workload that we all face. The QC program establishes the physicist as the QC leader and the go-to resource. And this also demonstrates the value of the physicist because no longer will the facility necessarily be calling applications for help. And no longer will they say, well, that's what applications told me to do, so that's what we've been doing forever. So it kind of puts the physicist perhaps at the top of the pyramid, and it changes that role for the physicist to become much more integrated and a leader and a resource to a facility. And this is good because it will bring the physicist into the program and become more of a central person. It establishes communication or it can establish communication directly with the lead interpreting radiologist. So there's a couple things that are specifically designed to force communication between the players in the QC program, including the tech, the RAD, the physicist, and a facility manager. And we'll get to those shortly, but there's a couple things in particular. One is a quarterly QC meeting to review QC among the players. And then there is a a optional 
form in the physics test that allows, that gives a template for allowing a physicist to put in some relevant information and send a letter or email directly to the lead interpreting radiologist uh, to inform them of the testing and the testing results. So, and then finally, um, it establishes communication directly with the facility, including in these quarterly QC meetings. And this also demonstrates the physicist's value. So with this program, it's directly and indirectly designed to in, be more inclusive of all the players and also put the physicist now becoming a prominent lead point person in um, running, advising, um, and teaching the program, which we'll get to in a second. So these are all good things for the physicist um, from a professional standpoint. So now again, why should we switch? So the easy, some of the easy answers are there's fewer quality control tests than the typical manufacturer QC. So there's less tests. There are takes less total time to do perform the testing, both from a technologist standpoint and from a physicist standpoint. There are now 2D and 3D or TOMO tests are in the single manual. So finally, we have a single manual that covers both um, 2D and 3D. Paper and electronic forms are provided by the ACR. It can be downloaded for free. Um, the, the PDF forms are uh, in the manual, and the Excel forms are on a link on the website, which we'll get to. Um, but the ACR feels that even though one might say, well, there's less tests and less time spent on this, um, we feel that there is a, a, a leap of improvement in terms of providing a better quality evaluation of the system, which we'll try and demonstrate here um, for a few reasons. So if we look at some of the physicist tests, I just wanted to, instead of looking at some of the forms and some of the messy uh, pictures, just highlight a few things that are improvements for specific tests. So for the ACR Phantom, we can now fail directly for artifacts. This is the first program that does that. And partly that be is because we have designed a Phantom that covers the majority of the detector area so that you can see the majority of the de detector and evaluate for artifacts. This is a substantial improvement. The majority, as we know, of problems and failures are with the detector performance and artifacts, and this allows you to directly fail. This is an advantage both for the techs and the physicist and the ACR reviewers. Um, so the Phantom covers the majority of the area. This is a big benefit. Um, we now evaluate CNR at MEE only um, to establish an MEE um, I guess baseline for lack of a better term. And then for ongoing testing, we then compare an annual CNR to the MEE CNR for consistency. So we're, we're getting a little bit away from hard action limits on some of our tests and we're getting into consistency checks. Um, there are two uh, TOMO specific tests, a Z resolution and a volume test. And these are excellent streamlined tests for verifying slice performance. Um, there was a lot of negotiation and work that went into uh, figuring out what is the best way and the most efficient way to get to the evaluations. So these are um, going to be introduced shortly. For AEC testing, there's a new paradigm, as I was mentioning earlier, that we are going to be um, evaluating AEC for different breast thicknesses, 2468, and at the mag stand. But we are only going to measure um, the SNR at MEE for a fixed value that has to be above a certain value. And then after MEE, um, after we measure the, the five different thicknesses and modes, we then compare that to consistency. So we look back to last year's measurements and then we say, are they within a certain range um, from last year's? And if they are, then we're good to go. There's no more correction factors. There's no more manufacturer um, detector serial numbers that have to be followed. So um, basically, we're looking at consistency for AEC. For average glandular dose, um, we uh, transitioned to a, um, a calculation um, published by Dance, and this will be um, utilized for both 2D and DBT. 
and we provide data so that you can use at least the current um, target filter combinations that are out there. That'll um, most likely be updated with time as systems change. And this formula and the worksheets that the ACR provides um, are specific to the ACR Phantom. But if you dig deeper into the, um, the literature, the papers describe how you can also use these dose calculations for different thicknesses and densities. So it's a little bit more um, clinically useful, perhaps, um, if you so uh, choose. And for the display devices, which includes the acquisition workstation, the radiologist workstation, printers, and um, light boxes, they are all now considered standalone devices. So the tests and the forms are singular for each device. So essentially, you can pull the procedure out, pull out a form, and then those two pieces can go to test those display devices. And this is helpful because this will contribute to the system to keep track of display devices throughout multiple MAP facilities and locations. So as we all know, that these display devices frequently also become on their own um, testing frequency. So they're not necessarily the same day as the unit, but they may, uh, as things are upgraded, repaired, moved, replaced, that those display devices then become their own, um, uh, have testing requirements. So that is important because it also gives a framework for how facilities can keep track of these things, how the physicists can keep track of these things, and also so inspectors can keep track and understand what's going on with these facilities. So these are some of the important highlights. Um, for Tech QC review, we have um, improved the way um, the forms for documenting, going through reviewing, and we've separated the physicist reviewing of the unit itself for the Tech QC and then reviewing the display devices for the Tech QC. So now they're kind of two different forms, two different procedures because we know that these display devices are separate animals from the actual units. So those are some of the highlights for the physicist. Um, and finally, we, we have moved a couple of the tests to MEE only. So half value layer KVP and collimation are now MEE only, except for the DBT systems that, or a DBT component of a system, um, collimation is still an annual requirement. And this was due to some of the um, dynamic collimation and the active collimation that some of the systems employ. So it was felt that that should be an annual test. So that is a reduction in some of the tests that were not um, found to be big um, failing contributions to an overall program. So this is a time savings. Um, so why else should we switch um, the new, uh, a new better phantom, which gives us better artifact detection. The QC program is structured for modern facilities that have multiple units, multiple workstations, multiple facilities. Um, we've emphasized the team approach with a QA committee of the four players, um, tech, rad, managers, physicists. And we really wanted to bring in one of the um, most important players, which is the radiologist, and make sure they knew what was going on in their facilities, in their programs, and that both the tech was contributing to this QC program and the physicist, and we wanted to have some way to document that that was happening. So we have some ways to do that. So standardization. Um, one of our hopes is that with everything being standardized, if you adopt this program across all your units and facilities, that you should expect cleaner MQSA inspections because there just will be less errors. Um, and we know standardization reduces errors. There's no more chasing manufacturer QC manual versions. We all know what that is um, like because that is a vulnerability because inspectors check QC manual versions sometimes. And if there's a typo or a mismatch, then that can be unpleasant. Um, current edition and future revisions will be provided by the ACR. Um, the forms will be provided by the ACR for free. And then the other thing is that um, 
there was an observation about the old days when we had one QC program back in the film screen day and how nice that was. But so now with this program, we're actually rejoining CT and MR programs with one program, one phantom, and it applies to all the units. So it's a similar model as the other accreditation programs, which also provides a element of standardization. So getting on to some of the resources. So there's a couple important things, and nowadays everybody goes to the website. So on the main mammography website, there's always an important announcement at the beginning. And, and as of recently, um, there's some mention of the new TOMO um, systems, the new QC program, the new webinars, and um, a resources page. So this is where you go to get um, some information. FAQs, this is where all of the most current um, documented responses are that will complement the manual itself. So this is where the ACR will put information or comments or clarifications or updates that may be missing from the manual or that may need to be um, corrected. So in this FAQ is where that lives. So you'd go to this section to find the latest um, and then it says when this is updated and this is updated um, when important things come out or um, periodically. There's no fixed date on how frequently those are updated. If you just scroll down the page, um, you'll see a section on quality control and equipment forms. So this is where you can get the RAD tech forms or the medical physicist forms, and these are Excel sheets. Um, so you can either print those or use them. Um, and just a little asterisk on, on the forms. Um, like all of these uh, quality control programs, um, we are allowed to modify um, the, the forms in between the test and the objective and the action limit. So these forms are not required that you use these forms. You can edit them um, to make them work for you as long as you come up with the same final action limits of what's trying to be tested. So. Um, they, that's one reason why there's not just PDFs, but we wanted forms because everybody modifies things as you go. Um, so this is um, the page for the physicist forms. So you can see that there's also the, there's a test summary. So like um, the days of the past where the ACR wants a single summary sheet, that is a sheet that we uh, need to use to submit for our either initial accreditation or renewal. Um, so that is listed there. Um, the physicist form, it's a one-page form. I'll show that in a second. There's also the MQSA uh, equipment checklist and then another link to the forms um, themselves. So there's an entire page for the ACR Digital MAMO QC manual, um, and it's called the resource page. And so on this single page, um, which gets linked to, this is where all of the important digital memo um, um, content is. So you have, you can purchase the manual, the FAQs, there is a uh, phantom scoring key, which we'll get to in a bit, and then there's the forms in Excel uh, for physics and text. There's also a part at the bottom that talks about approved phantom manufacturers um, for um, being able to buy the phantom, which is an important new thing that facilities buy phantoms come from manufacturers that have been gone through the approval process to um, manufacture and sell phantoms. So check this list is the current, um, right now there's five of them. Um, so other resources are the QC manual itself. Oftentimes one would assume that we read the instructions, but we actually might want to do that. Um, the website, the FAQs, the training webinars, and then the PDF from these slides. And then if all else fails, call the ACR. So nothing really is new to us, but I think the take home message is you got the manual, you got the website, and then you have a phone call. So those three are the primary resources. So one of the reasons we're having this uh, webinar today is to introduce the 2018 QC manual. And here it says quality control 2D and DBT. So it's the 2018 version replaces the 2016, and the 2016 was the 2D only 
version. This version contains the um, 2D and 3D. And then, of course, at the bottom, I always like to um, highlight the people that contributed to this manual. There's quite a cross-section of staff, physicists, techs, industry, and ACR staff. And then there's the, the ACR sent out a link to all accredited facilities to download this um, to accredited facilities. So I'm not sure um, how individual Physicists can get these manuals besides going to their facility and ask for a copy. But perhaps that could be a question for the ACR staff. So I wanted to introduce the um, final QC test for the physicist and sort of the structure. So there are 16 tests in this um, summary chart. We list the test on the left. There is the minimum frequency in the middle, and then there's correction corrective action time frame on the right. Um, so, and then we list some of the supplemental forms that we provide. There's a, a test summary form, a technique chart, and a letter for the radiologist. There's supplementary forms that are for the facility, the unit, and equipment, test equipment data. And then we give a list of um, recommended or required test equipment. And we worked very hard not to include anything that would be different except for the ACR digital map phantom itself. So that um, would need to be purchased by the facility, not necessarily by the physicist, of course. So there really should be no um, new test equipment that is required. So we moved the MQSA uh, list of that used to be a two-page list. We made it a one-page list for the MEE uh, MQSA requirements, and you do that only at MEE. We have nine tests that are specific to the unit itself. And these are MEE and annual tests. They all have different uh, corrective action timeframes. There's two tests that have been included that are sort of TOMA only tests. There's a Z resolution and a volume coverage. And then the rest are just for DBT and 2D, um, which we'll get to. There's three display, well, there's four, display device tests. So you have acquisition, work, rad workstation, film printer. And then you have two tech QC review tests. So you, the site um, or unit QC, and then there's the display device QC evaluation. Then there's the calibration um, checklist and a collimation assessment, which is um, for, for 2D is MEE and for um, DBT it's MEE and annual. And then here's the test where we've moved to MEE, which is half bialar KVP. We have a we have a troubleshooting ghost image evaluation and a view box luminance test has been moved to troubleshooting. So those are the tests. So then it gets a little bit more complicated in terms of well, what test do you do for what part of the system? So we've developed this very nice chart to say if you're doing um but using a system for both 2D and 3D acquisitions, you would go to this chart and say, okay, so what tests do I need to do? So if you're doing 2D testing, you would do everything in this column, which is basically the top part is the tech tests and the physics tests are the bottom. So this is both tech and physics. If you happen to have, well, let me back up. So there's an asterisk that follows um, the 2D procedure. So you would mimic that for some of the 3D tests or do the 2D component. So that's the 2D column. If you happen to have an add-on device for Tomo, and some of the systems out there have this add-on piece that you put on top of the um, 2D unit, and then it allows you to do Tomo. And I know GE has a system that does this, but we then had to delineate um, how to approach which 3D test, you have an add-on device, and then if you do a 2D and a 3D system, much like the Hologic systems, you would do the 2D column and the 3D column for your um, Tomo test. And there will become a time, if not already, where if, you're o if a facility is only doing Tomo acquisitions and Tomo only, then they would do this last column here. So this just ensures that um, it's the key to making sure um, that the proper tests are be doing for the proper type of um, system that's out there. Um, so also, as a physicist, we need to know what the techs do. 
So this is the technologist um, overview of their tests. So they have tests, they have management forms, they have tests for their mobile systems, and then they have an equipment list down here. Um, they have a weekly test for doing their phantom once a week, and if they have CR cassettes, they erase those once a week. And then everything else is monthly in terms of their um, compression, thickness indicator, visual checklist, their acquisition and um, radiologist um, QC, those are all monthly. Um, so all those last four are display devices and they're monthly. Um, there's a facility QC review test, which is quarterly, compression for semi-annually, that is not new. Um, and then repeat analysis, a system QC check for the radiologist, and then image quality feedback form. These are all as needed optional test. The last one, the image quality feedback, is something that could be um, adopted into the EQIP program, so that could be helpful to them. But this is just something um, I wanted to bring to everybody's attention instead of focusing heavily on the, the tech test. They have a similar chart with describes what QC they need to do depending on if, they, if they're just doing 2D, if they're doing um, 2D with a Tomo add-on device, if they're doing 2D and 3D, or if they're just doing 3D testing. So this chart describes what they need to be doing. Um, for those of you who have not seen the Phantom, I'm sure everybody has at this point, it's a larger Phantom, it's the almost identical thickness. Um, but again, to remind you that this is the list of approved vendors um, at the bottom of the web page here. In this picture, there's five right now, currently. So you have to make sure that they come from one of these five vendors. This is an image of the Phantom. There's new pass-fail criteria. They are now 232. 232 is exactly the same size as the screen film for three and three. Other than that, they go a little bit smaller to the right, and then we wanted to give at least one test object to the left to allow um, some gauging about how you're falling on the pass-fail spectrum. So that is just a new pass criteria, pass-fail criteria. So the big picture, there's a couple of slides for transitioning here that um, are kind of important and sort of the first time we've really tried to dig through this because um, in order to transition to the new manual, a mammal unit must first have an annual physics survey, and we call that the transition survey. Once the mammal unit has had its transition survey, it is now in the new QC program, and the tech can then begin to perform their QC. So it's kind of a one-two punch. Physics does testing, and then the next day, the tech can start their um, QC. The MAMO unit transition starts a one-year clock on the display devices within um, the facility. So we know that you can't necessarily do the display devices immediately or in the same day or in the same moment. So basically, you do one unit and then it starts a one-year clock to then do the display devices for the new QC program. Up until then, the facility would continue with their uh, manufacturer um, QC. So they would continue on as usual. Um, and then, as I was saying, until the display device has had its transition survey, it must continue using the manufacturer's program. Um, and then once it, the display device has had its transition, then the tech can begin the tech QC on the display device. So it's sort of the similar one-two punch on each display device. And then to reiterate, each display device needs to have its trans physics transition survey within one year of the mammal unit. So this way we're not letting, um, basically once you start down the path with one unit within your whole organization, you have one year to do um, the display devices. And then after the physics physicist does their testing, the technologist should start their um, tech testing the next day or the next week um, whenever that falls, and then they can stop the manufacturing testing. They do not have to continue. Um, so, some practical steps, and this is just sort of a recommended outline um, of how to transition. The first thing you want to do is buy a Phantom from an approved vendor. You want to organize a meeting with the relevant lead techs, facility manager, medical physicist, and um, lead interpreting physician to develop a plan and a schedule. So, this is actually very helpful um, to 
get the big picture and make sure that step one and two occur and there's nothing that's left out. And again, the take home message, and if we were having a SAM questions at the end, this would be it, um, that the physicists must do their testing before the tech does their testing. Um, and then after the physicist does their testing, the tech must start their testing. The tech cannot wait another year to start um, the ACR program after the physicist has done their transition survey. So that's another take home message. The ACR does not need to be notified um, when this happens. Um, this information will, will be reviewed by your MQSA inspector during your annual inspections. So you just make notes of the transition date for each device in your QC notebook, and that is all you need to do. Um, for display devices, it's the same process. The physicist um, tests using the ACR QC, and then the tech follows. Um, and again, um, after the first unit is tested by the physicist, all display devices have 12 months to be tested using the ACR program. In the meantime, facilities should continue using the display uh, manufacturer display QC. So here's a, uh, a bookmark note. Um, the key to successful transition comes from the initial group meeting, where you develop a schedule to make sure each unit or display device is having the proper QC methodology being performed. There may be overlap where you're performing ACR on a unit before the display or where it's the display device have been tested before the units are tested. As long as you have one large phantom that's been tested on a, on a unit, you can then use that to test all your display devices because you're now gonna have to look at a phantom on your display devices, which allows you to, if you test one unit, you can then use the phantom acquired the large phantom acquired on that unit to test multiple monitors. So then it sort of allows you the freedom to test them at will. You don't have to have um, all the units done before you start testing display devices. So here's an example of one way to transition. Um, have the physicist and the tech meet and train each other on how to perform and document everything correctly, um, both on the units and the display devices. And this includes determining what kind of unit and what kind of features you have on a unit, whether it's 2D, DBT, do you have an add-on unit, and which test needed to be formed. And once this is established, it will simplify everything. Um, then have your QA group, which is your tech manager physician, um, review the QC test, sort of have a, have a pre-QC quarterly meeting. And this orients the, the lead interpreting physician and the manager to what the tests are and what's coming down the road. Then you may want to have the tech start performing the QC test in parallel, which are not that difficult and do not take that much time, but they can practice doing the tests um, before doing the switch. And they can, um, and then maybe perhaps do this one to three months before the physicist does their testing, and this um, means you might be running parallel tech testing. But it's worth the investment, because as we know, it's oftentimes the documentation, not necessarily the testing, that can cause problems. And then if the end of the tech is once they're comfortable, the physicist and the tech review the, um, the results and to see how comfortable the tech is with performing the test, and then at that point, the physicist could test the unit and the next day the tech can start or continue on doing it and they can drop the old manufacturer testing. Um, so, and of course this may have to be scaled depending on how many units you have within your organization. So this is um, just one recommended example of how it might unfold. A few points for the physicist, since this is a physics talk. Learn the test yourself. We're kind of doing that today, but you never really learn it until you get the manual and you get on a unit and go through it. Um, and then teach the tech the test. We, you can reassure them that the, this program will be less time consuming for them, less burdensome. It's an improved program. You can remind them that once they convert to the QC program, this will completely replace the manufacturer's program. You can inform them of the sequence of transitioning unit first, then the tech follows, you introduce the new phantom, you teach them how to score the new phantom, 
and that there's no more subtracting for artifacts, that they can fail for artifacts. You can teach them how to evaluate for artifacts. So it's a great moment, again, to demonstrate value. And then finally, you can help make that overall schedule for all the units and displays. So it, um, I hope this has helped with sort of outlining some of the transition requirements and some of the trans uh, ways to approach transition. Um, and that this is actually um, hopefully uh, not too overwhelming at this point. So now we're going to go into some of the tests. This is a, a picture of the actual physicist summary sheet. At the top, there is uh, facility information, and then there's the middle section that kind of talks about what testing is performed. Um, there's all sorts of new types of equipment. There's different types of testing depending on is it an MEE, is it an annual survey, is it partial testing, what kind of um, piece of equipment is being tested, whether it's the unit, the monitors, the view box, the printers, and then is it on-site testing, is it oversight testing, um, and then down below list all the tests, and then on the right side are the pass-fail results, whether it's the 2D, 2D add-on, DBT, is there corrective action? And on the right side, there's some summary dose data. So this is the one-page summary sheet that the ACR would like to receive. And then this is a picture of the MEE page. We've now condensed this down to one. And at the bottom, we list the half-value layer, KVP, and collimation now lives here in terms of the summary sheets um, for MEE. So we're running a little bit um, behind on time, of course. Um, so there's a few highlights I want to point out. So for the phantom, the important thing is we now do a phantom in 2D mode and DBT mode. There is a CNR test that is for 2D only, and we measure the CNR with the little circular disk on the, in the middle of the phantom, and then after we measure that, it has to be above um, um, a certain value at MEE, and then we compare that um, annually to make sure it hasn't dropped more than 15% from the previous year. So this is where the there's a little CNR calculation in there for the physicist. This is not for the techs. We also measure um, a distance measurement, and then at the bottom of the page are the action limits. So that's something um, for the phantom. Um, we have a DBTZ resolution test, and basically this test is designed to quickly assess the um, in-plane resolution, and so we do this by taking the same phantom image, we choose the largest spec group, and we do um, some um, full width half max measurements on for the different slice locations from both minus three to plus three in the slice location, and then we, we look at our maximum signals over each spec group, we record those signal values, we record the mean background signal, and then we calculate a full width half max, and then we compare that to the MEE measurement to make sure that over time that has not um, changed within 30% um, of this MEE value. Um, so it is comes from the same phantom image. We're just going to start to do some, um, some signal measurements, and this test, depending on the system, may require that we use downstream software if the AW can't provide that. So we may have to go to a radiologist workstation or just some free offline software that can accommodate that. Um, spatial resolution, only important thing is that we do resolution for both 2D and DBT mode and in mag mode. So same test, um, but we now do that for TOMO. We have a TOMO volume coverage test that I mentioned. Um, where we take the phantom, we spin it around, we put a piece of aluminum from our half value layer kit, and we put one on the top and one on the bottom, and we um, visually um, evaluate if those lines are crisp both in the top and the bottom planes, and if they are, it's a pass, and if they are not, it is a fail. So that's the volume coverage to make sure that we're seeing the entire volume of the, the image or the, um, the data set. AEC. This is a, um, a modified test. There's nothing um, particularly um, earth-shaking about this, except for we are no longer comparing AEC pass-fail criteria to fixed action limit values. We are now comparing this um, 
for the most part to uh, previous year's measurements. So this is um, an example of an AEC test for a 2D measurement up in the right-hand corner, which I did not highlight. It says 2D because you would have another sheet for DBT if you're doing DBT and, and 2D. But for 2, 4, 6, and 8, and for mag mode at 4CM, we would acquire um, typical clinical images. Um, and then we measure, uh, calculate the SNR value using ROIs, and then for MEE and annual, we only at 4CM does it have to be above um, a lower limit for SNR. After that, for your annual, you do the SNR for four, and then also for 2, 4, 6, 8, and MAG, and it has to compare um, to last year's MEE. So this is last year, 58, 61, 63 for the SNR. And then up here is the current value, and then you compare to make sure those are within 15%. So no longer are we chasing correction factors or other manufacturer-specific ways to address um, and decide what those action limits are to be. We are going to just make sure that they're consistent over time. Um, and this also may take uh, downstream software if it doesn't uh, occur on the AW. Um, the dose measurements, again, we are doing that for 2D and 3D if you have those capabilities. So now it's just an added column on the dose form using the dance calculation. Um, nothing earth shattering there. And then you calculate the dose and you would compare it also to the unit indicated dose down here. So very simple, and this is all provided on the worksheet. And in the worksheet, there's all the tables for these, um, um, these factors, K, G, C, and S. So they're all provided, they're just not displayed here. Um, and the other thing that might be um, relatively um, new to the game is that we are, no, we are not adding together 2D and 3D for the three milligray uh, limit. It's really just an individual acquisition. For 2D, has to be less than three, and then for a T, uh, DBT, has to be less than three milligray. So that is slightly different that, that we are no um, longer considering adding those together for some of the combination units that, that live out there. For the unit checklist, there is a, um, I've just highlighted the one TOMO check that the assembly moves as designed through its range of motion. Everything else is uh, your typical unit checklist. Um, for the acquisition workstation, we are now, um, and this isn't necessarily new to the TOMO version of this manual, but we are for, for monitors that have the capabilities to do um, built-in calibrations or have test patterns, we're asking the physicist and the tech to evaluate those. So for acquisition monitors, we look at monitor condition, scratches, um, blemishes on the screen. We evaluate a test pattern if it's available. We do a luminance check if it's available. We check the um, GSDF if it's available. And if there's automated um, QC that's built in, that we are asking the facilities with your help, the physicists, to uh, make sure that's set up properly and take advantage of those built-in tests. Um, and then over on the right side, we have a uniformity check to make sure that the systems are uniform. So nothing new here, but again, this is that one page, one procedure for acquisition monitors. We have the similar test for the RAD workstation monitors, because we all know that there's can be dozens and dozens out there. So again, we look for ambient light conditions, uh, monitor condition. We now score a phantom um, on the um, physician workstation, um, which might be a little bit new. We measure the distance on those, so as that image goes through a pack system, we want to confirm that the, the distance measurement is, is accurate within reason. Test pattern, luminance check, grayscale, automated tests, luminance uniformity, and then finally, do the, does the luminance match within reason? So all of this is looks like a lot on one page. You can edit these, you can make these what you want, but this is relatively complete, so it's all on there so that we can see the big picture. Um, display devices, we continue on with the film printer. We now look at film printers we print the phantom only. We don't use test patterns printed from, from um, printer manufacturers themselves. We print the phantom. We get the background OD. We measure contrast. We measure Dmax. We measure the distance. All of this is straight off of phantom. 
all of this are no longer is it um, a baseline measurement. It's there's hard values for background density has to be greater than one six, the contrast has to be greater than 0.1, Dmax has to be greater than 3.1, and the measurement has to be um, within 14 millimeters of actual. So that is a straight up um, film printer QC test. This is the form that we are suggesting uh, use for the evaluation of the site tech QC program. So these are the tests that the technologists will do on the unit in the room. So we review those and then we've provided a way to a little bit easier um, approach at documenting things like missing data, incomplete scoring, um, missing corrective action. So you can just do some check boxes and then at the bottom you can do additional comments. And then so that's for the unit and then we have the same form for display devices. So when you go to a facility, now this may be, and this can be multiple facilities because you could, you know, you could have dozens of locations where workstations sit, whether they're at um, corporate offices or in physician homes, but this is where you could review the tech doing QC on those displays. So in this example, we have three workstations and a printer somewhere, um, which we would detail up above. And in this case, it's the outpatient reading center on Smith Street. And then again, we give some areas to document and note some of the problems that may be occurring within that program. So this is a summary sheet of the Tech QC for display devices. Um, this is a list of um, major component service upgrade replacement and, and repair. This, this list came almost verbatim off the FDA website for if the physicist needs to do on-site testing if there's an issue or oversight testing. The intent here was that this would continue to grow and be modified with time as digital and Toma units sort of get integrated into this list because a lot of this comes from film screen. But this is identical to the FDA list. We just incorporated this into the QC manual because it thought, thought it would be helpful. Um, so this is not a new um, um, list at all. This is just identical to the FDA. Um, when things happen to a unit, what needs to be done by who and by where. Um, in the physics um, test and the worksheets, there's a uh, technique chart where um, we allow the physicists to give um, techniques for screening and diagnostic mammography, uh, implant, displaced mammography, and then at the bottom, we have a little chart for helping set up the tech QC and give the technique chart for how phantoms should be acquired for the weekly QC for the techs. So this is sort of a little bit more complete um, technique chart, but I think it'd be very helpful for um, facilities. This is an example of our uh, letter to the radiologist that can be easily populated. What we have intended to do here is allow the physicist to communicate directly to the radiologist to, again, demonstrate that value, um, where they make it more in a letter format instead of a report, because reports can oftentimes be um, off-putting. So if it's a letter addressed to a lead interpreting uh, radiologist, basically what we thought is highlighting image quality where you can give image quality scores for the 2D and a, and, and a TOMO example um, where it's pass fail you highlight radiation doses to the 2D and the 3D and then on the right side you can talk about action items that you might find that are required that are recommended you can have comments for monitors monitor QC viewing conditions you can have comments on how the techs are doing and then you can kind of sign data so this format we thought would be more approachable by physicians than sending a report with a cover page that is hard to read. So that is, um, again, a way to add to demonstrate the value for the physicist. Um, there's one new test that is going to be new and going to need your help for the technologist. It's the thickness indicator test. Basically, we did not want to introduce any more test objects, so we came up with allowing the physicist and the tech to create their own phantom to confirm thickness. In this example, we use two rolls of tape that are 52 millimeters, and then once a month, they would verify that it's 52 millimeters within reason. Also, we could use the old phantom 
could be a great thickness indicator test tool. So that could be used also. It's probably a little bit more reproducible and, than tape, but um, this is a monthly test, and this is something that will be new to the techs and new to the physicist. Um, facility QC review is the quarterly test that I talked about, and there's a couple points that we uh, created on this form, which is really just a meeting agenda, which is that we summarize the physics results, we summarize the tech results, we have some other quality test um, um, points to review in terms of um, service and inspections and accreditation that we thought would be good content for a meeting for the tech, the manager, the physicist, and the physician. And then they would then sign off on this on the next page, which um, I did not bring up here. There's two more forms I want to show here uh, before we wrap up. One is the facility offsite display location. So we have created basically a roster for a facility to keep track of where they have offsite displays. So basically this is just a list of where they are. Um, so if you are this facility, you will have you might have offsite displays at these three facilities. So this is so that the the techs and the managers during an inspection could say, okay, we have facilities at these three locations, and then at those three locations, you have a display device checklist that those facilities that have displays could keep track of their QC. So in this example, they have two reading rooms, a printer, a laser printer, and two view boxes. And then for each month that the QC is done, they put the date and the initials that the QC was performed. And at the bottom, they put the date and the physicist name or initials of when the annual testing was done on those displays. And the intention here is that this sheet is what can be handed off to uh, inspectors to demonstrate that we have this many displays, and the, here's the QC be done at each location where we have displays. So to wrap up, the million dollar question, is it worth switching to the ACR QC program? And we feel strongly that the answer is yes, for reasons such as ease of learning, ease of documentation, there's less tests, less time needed to perform the test, there's better forms, better handling of offsite equipment, better handling of multi-facility situations, an improved phantom, um, and there's advantages of a singular QC program across the board, and most importantly, an overall superior program that focuses on quality while respecting the time and resources of mammography facilities and the physicists. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the ACR staff. They are probably going to wrap up quickly, but if they have some responses to any of the incoming questions, um, I will turn it over to them, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Burns. We really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to wrap up quickly because we're at the end of the hour. I want to clarify, we got this question a whole bunch from our technologist last week. This is not an approved CE or SAM activity, so my deepest apologies that there are no credits to be claimed. I also want to highlight that uh, it's, it's, if a test is listed in the manual as required, it is required. I also want to highlight uh, that we have our FAQs posted on the Digital Mammography QC Manual Resources webpage. Those FAQs answer a lot of the questions that were asked today. Uh, one that I want to highlight that is described in pretty good detail uh, in that document is that an annual survey, as Dr. Burns described, the transition survey is required. In the FAQ, we describe in detail that the MEE test data need to be available for reference and baseline uh, purposes. And if that data, those data are not available, then those MEE uh, tests do need to be done so that the uh, data are available uh, in the future for baseline uh, purposes. With that, thank you so much. And uh, we will pour over these questions next week and respond uh, in mass to all registrants with answers to uh, the questions that, uh, that we can and the rest we may address in future FAQs. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.